Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. This is the fifth video in my series covering all of inflammation and immunology. And this video is going to cover B and T cell development, activation, and function, as well as a list of important cytokines, which really didn't fit in a video, so I just kind of stuck it in here. Now this is going to be a little bit longer video than I usually post because I'm basically condensing most of an immunology class into one short video, but I will try to move through these things at light speed and only cover the most important material. If you're just looking for a specific part of this video, you can look down at the video description below the YouTube video and there are some clickable timestamps that will jump you right to the appropriate spot. So for example, if you're only interested in how B cells get activated, you can jump to that part in the video. We will start off with a couple of quick review slides from some of the earlier videos we already covered. If this stuff is not clear to you, please do go back and watch some of the videos I have that do things like compare adaptive and innate immunity and chronic acute inflammation, etc. We have already covered acute inflammation extensively in our previous videos. When acute inflammation is not sufficient to deal with the pathogen, chronic inflammation takes over. Chronic inflammation is mediated by B and T cell leukocytes or lymphocytes. These white blood cells make up the adaptive immune system, which takes a little bit longer to kick in than the innate immune system, but has higher potency and specificity. B cells are the leukocytes that turn into plasma cells and release antibodies once they have been activated. Antibody is the most important part of the humoral immune system. It is a secreted free-floating form of the B cell receptor. So whatever antigen activated the B cell through an interaction with the B cell receptor will also be recognized by the antibody. And in our next video, we're gonna cover antibody in a lot of detail, so we're not gonna to talk too much about it here. B cells are activated primarily in response to extracellular pathogens. So most of the bacteria that first come to your mind are going to be extracellular pathogens. So that's mostly what we're talking about here. There are two main types of T cell, each of which are part of the cell mediated immunity. CD8 T cells, which are named for the CD8 surface markers, are the cytotoxic T cells. These lymphocytes release porphyrin and granzyme to cause lysis of the infected cells, similar to how NK cells function. These CD8 cells cause apoptosis of cells that are infected by intracellular pathogens. This is primarily going to be viruses and the small number of intracellular bacteria like chlamydia or legionella. Cytotoxic T cells also play a role in triggering apoptosis of cancerous cells to prevent the spread of cancer. CD4 T cells, which are named for their CD4 surface markers, are referred to as the helper T cell. They do not fight pathogens directly, but help various other cells to do so by releasing cytokine signals. There are two subtypes of CD4 helper T cell, Th1 and Th2. Th1 helper T cells primarily activate cytotoxic CD8 T cells and macrophages, while Th2 helper T cells primarily activate B cells. We're going to talk in more depth throughout this video about what you're looking at here, but I do want to quickly go through this graph here to give you an idea of the big picture topics we're talking about. Now, depending on what device you're watching on and how good your Wi-Fi connection is, this video may be tough for you to read. So you can go to my website by clicking this orange box here to be taken to a web page that has higher quality pictures of everything you see in the slides. And all the material that's wrapped up in this flow chart has a high yield rating of 10. For those of you that aren't familiar with the high yield rating, it's a rating scale from zero to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for the USMLE step one medical board exam. We'll start with the extracellular pathogens and how they're mainly fought against. So B cells is one way we'll fight against extracellular pathogens. An antigen present on the extracellular pathogen will bind to the B cell receptor and then there are two options from there. There's T cell independent B cell activation, which is when the B cell pretty much just gets activated by the presence of that antigen binding the surface of the B cell. 
Once activated, it's going to produce antibody against that antigen and fight the pathogen. Then there's also T cell dependent B cell activation, where the B cell will take in that antigen and then present it on its surface MHC. That will attract a Th2 helper CD4 T cell. And then once the two of those cells bind, the T cell and the B cell, the T cell is going to become activated, and then the T cell is going to release cytokines, which will activate the B cell. So now both are active, and again, once a B cell is activated, it's going to proliferate and release antibody, which will fight whatever antigen triggered this whole thing to start off. Th1 T cells are also going to fight against extracellular pathogens. This will start when an antigen-presenting cell, like a macrophage or a dendritic cell, will phagocytose the pathogen, the extracellular pathogen. It'll chew it up into fragments, and then it will present a fragment of that pathogen on its MHC surface molecules as an antigen. Doing so will uh, attract a Th1 CD4 T cell or helper cell. That interaction between the antigen presenting cell and the T cell will activate the T cell, causing it to proliferate and release cytokines. And once a helper T cell is active, it's primarily going to function by activating other cells. In this case, the active helper cell will help turn on macrophages so that they can go and phagocytose whatever extracellular pathogen you're trying to fight, as well as help to activate CD8 T cells, the cytotoxic cells. Now, when we're dealing with an intracellular pathogen, it's primarily going to be fought by CD8 cells. What happens here is the body's own cell, which has an intracellular infection, is going to act as its own antigen-presenting cell. It's going to present a fragment of the pathogen on its own MHC molecules, which are on the surface of almost every cell in our body. It's going to then interact with the CD8 cell, activating the CD8 T cell or the cytotoxic T cell. And once that T cell's active, it can go cause apoptosis of the infected cell. Now we'll talk about B and T cell development. Both T cells and B cells begin life in the bone marrow and arise from multipotent hematopoietic stem cells. Immature B cells remain in the bone marrow to complete maturation. You can think of B for bone marrow and B cell while the immature T cells leave the bone marrow and travel to the thymus to complete maturation. Again, you can think T cell, thymus, both Ts. The bone marrow and the thymus are referred to as primary lymphoid organs. These primary lymphoid organs are where B cells and T cells differentiate and mature. Absence of a primary lymphoid organ, such as the absence of the thymus in DeGeorge syndrome, prevents the normal development of white blood cells and can lead to immunodeficiency. Once they've matured, B and T cells move to the secondary lymphoid organs, such as the lymph node and the spleen. This is where these cells come into contact with foreign particles. If the pathogen the cell can interact with is present, the cell will be activated. After activation, the cell proliferates, making clones of itself, that are all capable of recognizing and fighting against the same antigen or pathogen. However, not all T and B cells will be activated. A large majority of these mature cells will not encounter the type of foreign material they recognize. If the pathogen or foreign material that B or T cell can fight against isn't present in the body, there's no need to be activated. The foreign material or pathogen that the cells recognize is determined by the unique surface receptors on those cells. An antigen is the specific structural sequence the receptor can bind to. For example, a protein fragment of a pathogen that the cell is trying to fight. All of the receptors on a given T or B cell are the same and recognize the same antigen. When the receptor binds to the appropriate antigen, it signals the cell to become active and proliferate. You need a nearly infinite variability in these receptors so that you can fight almost any pathogen you encounter. Therefore, while the leukocytes are in the primary lymphoid organs, a wide variety of receptor variability is randomly generated through VDJ recombination. This change in the portion of the genome that encodes for the cell's receptors allows the different leukocytes to interact with a huge variety of antigens. 
The problem with randomly generating surface receptors is that some of these leukocytes will now be able to bind to the body's own cells. If these self-reactive lymphocytes were activated, they would cause autoimmune damage where the immune system targets the body's tissue instead of foreign material. The body has a two-step process for preventing this called negative selection. In the primary lymphoid organs, self-reactive lymphocytes are removed by central tolerance, also known as clonal deletion. Here, developing T and B lymphocytes that interact too strongly with self-antigens undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. In the secondary lymphoid organs, there is a similar process called peripheral tolerance or clonal energy. Here, self-reactive T or B cells that bind to soluble self-antigens undergo energy. And this is when the cells are prevented from proliferating or being activated, but they're not actively killed. It doesn't undergo apoptosis, it's just prevented from doing anything, so it's just kind of stuck there. Here is a summary table from the material over the last few slides. You may want to look this back over to review some of that, and you can pause the video if you want to do that now. Now we're going to go into more detail about the activation of the mature B and T cells. The major histocompatibility complexes, or MHCs, are the cell surface molecules encoded by the human leukocyte antigen genes, or HLA genes. MHCs present antigens to T cell receptors. T cell receptors cannot recognize an antigen unless it is presented by the MHC. The MHC is sort of like a cup that holds whatever antigen in it. And the T cells won't recognize this antigen that's in the cup unless the cup is also there. So if the antigen's just floating around, the T cell has no idea it's there. With CD4 and CD8 cells, the antigen presented must be a protein, AKA a peptide. Other macromolecules like carbohydrates can elicit immune response via other mechanisms, but the response is much greater to a protein antigen because T cells are involved. This is why vaccines that contain a carbohydrate capsular antigen often conjugate the antigen to a peptide to increase the immune response against the vaccine. For the purposes of the step one exam, there are two types of MHC you need to know. MHC1 is present on all nucleated cells, which basically means it's on every cell that's not a red blood cell and MHC1 activates CD4 T cells. MHC2 is present primarily on antigen presenting cells like the macrophages and dendritic cells, and the MHC2 activates CD8 T cells. And the best way to remember this is a simple math mnemonic that a lot of people use. So first you think that the two times four equals one times eight. MHC2 goes with CD4, and MHC1 goes with CD8. As I've mentioned, the CD4 T cells are activated by an interaction with the antigen presenting cells, or APCs. These antigen presenting cells, which are usually macrophages or dendritic cells, phagocytose extracellular pathogens, break them up into tiny fragments, and then present those fragments on their surface MHC2 so that that MHC2 and the antigen can interact with the CD4 T cells and activate those CD4 T cells. To prevent accidental activation, there are multiple points of control in this interaction, and all of them must be present to activate the CD4 T cell. First, the T cell receptor must recognize the antigen it has specificity for, while also recognizing that the antigen is being presented on an MHC molecule. An antigen independent signal, called the co-stimulatory signal, is required as well. Here, a CD28 surface molecule on the T cell recognizes B7 surface molecules on the antigen presenting cell. And here's a picture of what that would look like. We have the antigen presenting cell here in blue on the right side, and then we've got the CD4 T cell on the left in green. And the two of them are binding together because all of these things we've talked about are present. So you've got the MHC, which has the black circular antigen presented in it, then the T cell receptor is going to recognize that antigen as well as the MHC molecule, here represented by the CD4 surface marker binding to the MHC. 
Then just above that, you've also got the co-stimulatory signal of CD28 binding B7. CD8 T cells are activated by an interaction with the cell that has an intracellular infection. This infected cell can be of almost any type. The antigen is presented on the surface MHC1 of the infected cell. To become active, the CD8 cell must recognize the antigen and the MHC. CD8 cells also require the same co-stimulatory signals as CD4 cells. Here's another picture showing you what that would look like. You've got the infected cell on the right side in blue, which is going to present the antigen from whatever pathogen is infecting it. And then you've got the CD8 T cells here on the left in green. And again, you've got the T cell receptor is recognizing the antigen and the MHC, while the CD28 surface marker on the T cell binds the B7 surface marker on the infected cell, giving it the co-stimulatory signal. There are two ways B cells can be activated, T cell independent activation and T cell dependent activation. During T cell dependent B cell activation, which is a bit of a mouthful, an interaction between Th2 helper T cells is required to activate the B cell. Here, an inactive B cell phagocytoses an extracellular pathogen and acts sort of like the antigen presenting cell by presenting a fragment of that pathogen on its MHC2 to the inactive T cell. Now, the antigen that the B cell presents is also the antigen that recognizes that pathogen. The antigen that the B cell is presenting is the same antigen that its own B cell receptors recognize. And of course, the B cell receptor is just another name for a membrane-bound antibody. So this B cell presents the antigen. It attracts a T cell to come over. Once this binding between the two cells happens, the T cell is activated. Once the helper T cell is activated, it releases cytokines and in turn activates that B cell. B cell goes on to then create antibody and that's primarily how it's going to function through humoral immunity. In T cell independent B cell activation, free floating antigen binds to the antibodies or B cell receptors on the surface of the B cell. This type of B cell activation does not require help from a T cell. However, it is less potent and does not result in isotype switching. As a result, you're only going to end up with IgM. You're not going to get IgG. Now we will quick go through some of the important cytokines for the medical board exam. Of course, cytokines are small proteins used as signaling molecules during immune response and inflammation. There's a huge list of these, but I'm just going to try to focus in on the few most important ones. <coughs> Interleukin-1, or IL-1, is released by sentinel macrophages during acute inflammation to cause a change in the vessel endothelium that promotes neutrophil extravasion, and it also plays a role in the formation of fever. Interleukin-2, or IL-2, is secreted by T cells to stimulate the proliferation of other T cells during an immune response. Some immunosuppressants inhibit IL-2 function in order to decrease the immune response. IL-2 also activates NK cells, and recombinant IL-2 can be given to increase the NK cell activity to fight certain cancers. Interleukin-8, IL-8, and leukotriene B4, or LTB4, are chemotactic factors which attract neutrophils during acute inflammation. This is similar to how C5A complement also attracts neutrophils during acute inflammation. And these chemotactic factors help the neutrophils get to the right part in the body so that they know where the damage or infection is. Interferon is released by T cells and NK cells in response to intracellular infections like viruses or tuberculosis. Interferon activates macrophage phagocytic activity and causes infected cells to inhibit virus protein synthesis. Interferon also plays a key role in activating macrophages to form granulomas. Tumor necrosis factor mediates septic shock as well as increasing apoptosis of cancer cells, which is part of the reason it got its name. 
TNF also acts similarly to IL-1 during neutrophil recruitment and acute inflammation. So it has some of those same properties. Inhibitors of tumor necrosis factor can be used to treat things like rheumatoid arthritis. That brings us to the end of this video. If you like my videos but would like to either be able to speed up the videos or slow down the videos, you can click on this orange box here and I have a quick video that shows you how you can change the speed of anything on YouTube, including my videos, which at times can be a little slow, I know. I've also got a link here in the black box to my next video in the inflammation and immunology section, which is going to go in depth covering antibody structure, formation, and function, as well as autoimmune diseases and how autoantibodies play into that. Thank you so much for watching this video and good luck with the rest of your studying.